Christopher Browning is the Frank Porter Graham Professor of History at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Professor Browning received his PhD from the University of Wisconsin, and prior to joining the faculty at UNC, he taught at Pacific Lutheran University for many years. I think I can say with little fear of contradiction that Professor Browning is the leading historian of the Holocaust working today, and indeed should be considered one of the seminal figures in the development of Holocaust historiography throughout the post-war period. One of the things that makes Browning's scholarly achievements so impressive is that he has made field-defining contributions not just in one, but in several distinct areas of Holocaust research. Beginning with his first book, The Final Solution in the German Foreign Office, Browning has done as much as anyone to untangle the complex institutional history of the Holocaust's origins within the German bureaucracy. Continuing with a series of seminal essays in the mid-1980s, subsequently uh, gathered together in two essay collections, Fateful Months Essays on the Emergence of the Final Solution from 1985 and the Path to Genocide Essays on the Launching of the Final Solution from 1992 and culminating with his magisterial The Origins of the Final Solution from 2004, Browning emerged as the world's leading authority on the origins of the Holocaust. Browning articulates what he terms a moderate functionalist account of Nazi policy in which the interaction of bureaucratic elites working towards broad goals set from the very top increasingly radicalized the solutions proposed to the self-imposed Jewish problem. This approach represents, I would say, the consensus view among serious scholars of the Holocaust today. Browning's contribution to the field of Holocaust history do not end with his path-breaking work on the decision-making process, however. Indeed, Browning is probably best known for a work which has almost nothing to do with the decisions to exterminate European Jewry. Rather, it has to do with the reasons why perpetrators on the ground agreed to implement those decisions. Ordinary Men, Reserve Police Battalion 101, and The Final Solution in Poland, first published in 1992, quickly established itself as the defining work in the field of what has come to be known as perpetrator studies. Browning's argument was that a variety of situational factors, including a human inclination to obey authority and peer pressure, led otherwise non-ideological ordinary Germans to participate in mass murder, uh, at the time, this book was subject to a vigorous critique by Daniel Goldhagen, and I think with 10 years of hindsight, we can safely say that Browning emerged uh, in the stronger position from that debate. In recent years, Browning has turned his attention to yet another uh, area within Holocaust research, what might be seen as the opposite side of the coin. If ordinary men asked us to imagine what motivated perpetrators of the Holocaust, Browning's recent work asks us to reconstruct the life worlds of its victims. Ordinary Jews caught up in the Nazis' continental murder spree. In doing so, Browning has once again blazed a trail, a new trail for subsequent historians by treating the judicial testimony of victims as a wholly usable source for the reconstruction of wartime events, something many historians had been previously reluctant to do. Whether dealing with Nazi elites making key decisions, ordinary Germans deciding to participate in murder, or ordinary Jews simply trying to survive, Browning has brought to his work a meticulous attention to detail, a keen ability to read between the lines of his evidence, and above all, a deeply humane understanding of the complexities and tragedies of human experience. Tonight, Professor Browning will be speaking on Holocaust History and Survivor Testimony, the Strakovice Factory Slave Labor Camp, and he will be happy to take questions afterwards. Please join me in welcoming Professor Christopher Browning. Well, thank you very much, Devin, for the very effusive introduction, uh, and thank you all for coming this evening. In February 1972, a man named Walter Becker stood in a courtroom in Hamburg awaiting a verdict. Walter Becker had followed a path to that courtroom, uh, starting with his experiences as a soldier in World War I, where he had fought on both the Eastern and Western fronts, 
He had then uh, gone into a career as a policeman, a professional policeman in Weimar, Germany. By 1930, he had joined the SPD, the German Socialist Party, uh, a decision that cost him his job in 1933 when the Nazis came to power and they purged uh, from the police uh, and other uh, government institutions those who had been supporting the opposition. The SPD was one of the most foremost uh, opponents of the Nazis. But shortly thereafter, uh, Walter Becker made his peace with the Nazis, was reinstated in the police, uh, and uh, took on party membership in 1937 when uh, the party roles were open once again after they had processed the landslide of new applicants that they had been deluged with in 1933. He also applied to get into the SS. The SS rejected him. Uh, he was not considered to be uh, that sufficient uh, in his background to join the elite uh, of the Nazi party. And indeed, when the war broke out, he was sent to what by uh, police standards, by a man hoping to make a career uh, with the Nazis in World War II, uh, was not a major step, sent to be the charge of the police of a small industrial town in south central Poland, the town of Starakowice where he was stuck for the entire war, never transferred, never promoted, uh, and thus by Nazi standards had an utterly undistinguished career, by Nazi standards a total non-entity. What brought him to the courtroom in Hamburg, however, was that in the course of his undistinguished career by Nazi standards in Strakowice, he presided over the liquidation of the Jewish ghetto in the adjacent Jewish town of Vierbschnik, in October of 1942, a day in which nearly 4,000 Jews were sent to Treblinka, from which there was not a single survivor, and some 1,600 Jews were shipped to three uh, rapidly constructed uh, forced labor camps in Strakowice, where they would work uh, in the factories that the Germans had confiscated and where they were increasingly short of labor. Precisely because 1,600 Jews had not been sent to Treblinka, but entered the path of Nazi slave labor, there was absolutely no shortage of witnesses after the war to testify in court to the fact that Becker had been in charge of the ghetto liquidation, that he had played a very active role, uh, not only in directing operations, but also personally in committing a number of killings and beatings. Uh, so this was a rare case when, despite the Nazi attempt to leave no witnesses, uh, the judicial uh, prosecutors in Germany had the luxury of dozens, dozens of people who came to that courtroom to testify in detail about what Becker had done. However, uh, when uh, Judge Erhardt in that courtroom uh, opened the proceedings, he began introducing his verdict, which is read out in German court, uh, by stipulating that of all the evidence that the judicial world has to deal with, the least reliable is that of eyewitness testimony. That the ideal eyewitness has to be, in his words, disinterested, indifferent, attentive, intelligent, distanced, none of which, of course, could possibly apply to Jewish witnesses who had uh, seen their families taken away and murdered and were now testifying against the man who commanded that operation of mass murder. The judge went on then to uh, dismiss testimony uh, in other ways as well uh, and ultimately ended up basically uh, in very derogatory terms, disparaging a number of the witnesses individually and then having concluded that there was, quote, no reliable evidence to counter the absurdly transparently mendacious account that Walter Becker himself gave, pronounced that Walter Becker uh, must be acquitted uh, because uh, he was innocent until proven guilty and no sufficient evidence stood to convict him. Walter Becker walked out of the court a free man and continued to enjoy his police pension. I had, by that point, when I encountered this verdict, uh, worked for nearly two decades in German judicial records. I had seen many uh, court cases in which I felt uh, that justice had not been fully served, appallingly light sentences 
for people who had conducted mass murder uh, and acquittals on all sorts of technicalities. Uh, but this one still took my breath away. Without doubt, this was the most egregious miscarriage of justice that I had encountered in any of the many, many German court cases that I had read. And my first reaction to that, quite simply, was anger. Uh, that if Walter Becker could get away uh, in that courtroom uh, with an acquittal, uh, I could at least put him in a historian's hell. He could be between uh, the book covers in every major library uh, with a record of what he had done. And so I resolved at some point when there was opportunity presented, I would go back uh, and uh, research this case in greater detail. I already had a long list of things that I had to do, but eventually the time came when I had cleared my desk sufficiently that I could return uh, to a study of, of Walter Becker and his role uh, in Strakowice and Vierbschnik. Once, however, I began to investigate uh, it more thoroughly, uh, it quickly became apparent to me that Walter Becker was not the most interesting aspect of it, and anger was not the best motive out of which to write history, uh, and that there were several things that in fact were going to become much more central to the study that I was working on than uh, the egregious miscarriage of justice in a Hamburg courtroom. Uh, the first of these was the factory slave labor camps themselves. We know a great deal about the major ghettos, Warsaw, Lodz, Vilna, and so forth. We know a great deal about the major death camps, Auschwitz-Treblinka, the major concentration camps, Dachau, Mauthausen. Uh, but uh, in alongside the SS camps and the ghettos, there were literally hundreds and hundreds of small uh, labor camps not run directly by the SS, but in fact run by various German employers who got uh, Jews allocated to them uh, and basically uh, built, constructed, guarded, managed a whole series, uh, hundreds and hundreds of camps across Europe uh, in which uh, Jews were incarcerated uh, and worked without pay. These inhabitants were literally slaves. They were property of the SS, contractually rented to German private enterprise on a per head per day basis in which the employers, of course, paid the SS for their slaves but did not pay the workers themselves. Uh, and uh, that uh, what the dynamics of this free enterprise holocaust, uh, of the camp system that was built by uh, German uh, uh, employers and German businesses as opposed to the SS and police, uh, was a chapter of the Holocaust we knew very little about because most of these camps, in fact, were relatively small uh, and thus had never attracted anything like the attention uh, of the large camps, something like Auschwitz with its 100,000 prisoners. Uh, and so I wanted to fill this lacuna in Holocaust historiography, what, uh, what are the dynamics of the factory slave labor camps. The other aspect of the study that became increasingly important to me uh, was uh, the source that I would have to work with. Uh, German industry, unlike German bureaucrats, were not in love with their files. They had no trouble destroying the paper trail behind them. Uh, and that uh, for uh, the Braunschweig Stahlwerke uh, that had run the factories in Sorakovica, uh, we have virtually no documents at all. Uh, and in this area, the German administration also uh, had left very little behind, uh, that this was not going to be a study that could be based upon uh, surviving German documentation. In terms of post-war interrogations, uh, very few Germans were interviewed, and they lied uh, for the most part uh, that these uh, interviews are, are transparently mendacious. They're of very little use that if I was going to write a history of the Starakovica camps, it was going to have to be based overwhelmingly upon survivor testimonies. <clears throat> and this, uh, in my case, uh, I was going to have uh, the, the uh, relative abundance. Uh, in the end, I have gathered uh, testimonies from 292 uh, survivors, uh, some of them multiple testimonies, the first given in 1945 and the last a personal interview I did in 2008. 
so that these are testimonies that stretch out over uh, a number of decades. Uh, and that uh, certainly in terms of volume, precisely because they had been sent to the labor camps and for reasons we'll talk about, in these labor camps there's a fairly high survival rate. Uh, I was going to have an abundance of survivor testimony even if I was going to have almost no other kinds of evidence to work with. Now, for a number of my colleagues, the prospect of trying to write a professionally respectable Holocaust history in which one is dependent almost entirely on survivor testimony uh, is a, a, a circumstance that they are very leery about. Uh, for some, uh, Holocaust uh, survivor testimony has to be treated very, very carefully with all the frailties of human memory to begin with, to then deal with traumatized human memory uh, was uh, going to uh, raise serious questions about reliability. And indeed, many people who use survivor testimony say, well, it's very important for authenticity. It's important to demonstrate how survivors uh, remembered these events, how they felt about things subjectively, but of course it can't be used uh, for issues of factual accuracy uh, because human memory simply is too weak. Uh, to give us the kind of detail and precision needed to write a careful historical uh, study. Uh, and uh, thus, uh, for, for some of my colleagues, this was considered to be uh, somewhat uh, of a dubious enterprise. Others, on the other hand, I think have taken survivor testimony and have uh, basically said uh, it is beyond being an historical source in another way. That is, the survivor is the messenger from a different universe uh, who comes back to relate uh, to us other people who otherwise cannot even begin to comprehend what they experienced uh, and that we may stand in awe of their testimony, but we certainly cannot critically judge it. Uh, who am I, born uh, 1944 on the safe side of the Atlantic, uh, to be uh, making critical judgments about people who were there and experienced this and deciding uh, who is telling the truth and who is not, who is accurate and who is not. Uh, and they could consider the very prospect of someone like me uh, combing through these testimonies and making cold professional judgments about historical reliability to be uh, almost an act of blasphemy. So uh, I was caught between two very uh, different kinds of potential critiques, but in the end I decided I had to go ahead anyway because there are just too many parts of the Holocaust, like the factory slave labor camps in Strakowice, uh, for which we do not have uh, more traditional forms of evidence. We do not have letters and diaries uh, of the victims. We do not have German documentation or even sufficient post-war testimony from the perpetrators. Uh, and uh, to not uh, use survivor testimony would be to consign these to the oblivion of total forgetfulness. And it did indeed seem to me uh, certainly far more serious in terms of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of blasphemy, I guess I could use the word, uh, of, uh, of you know, being critical and studying survivor testimony in a rather uh, cold and professional way uh, was uh, to simply uh, not study it at all and to allow uh, important aspects of the Holocaust to simply slip into oblivion. Uh, so I decided I would proceed. And certainly we do know uh, in the use of survivor testimony the dangers of not looking at it critically. Uh, two cases perhaps most notorious, one uh, is uh, 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 you know, the, uh, the case of, of Ivan Demyanyuk or John Demyanyuk, the, the Cleveland auto worker uh, who was identified by survivors looking at a photo spread as being Ivan the Terrible of Treblinka. And on the basis of five such survivor identifications, uh, John Demenik was extradited to Israel, put on trial, convicted. Uh, and then, as uh, while the case was under appeal, new evidence came out of the Soviet Union that indicated that he was not Ivan the Terrible of Treblinka, but Ivan the Less Terrible of Sobibor, that he had gotten the wrong man. And the Israeli Supreme Court had to, in fact, void the verdict, send him back to the United States, where after a long delay, he was then subsequently now extradited to Germany, where he's standing trial for being the Ivan that he really is, uh, not uh, the wrong Ivan. Uh, 
Uh, and of course, there's the case of Fragments by Benjamin Velkomirsky, uh, in which uh, this author was lionized and highly praised for his uh, childhood memoir, uh, only to have it revealed later that he was born in Switzerland after the war uh, and that this book was a, uh, a, a total invention. Uh, so that uh, to use survivor testimony but to not use it critically is, I think, uh, a course that is simply not acceptable. Certainly, as I committed to the project and began to go through uh, my 292 uh, different witnesses, and many of them, their multiple testimonies, it became clear to me, another thing historians always have to keep in mind, is of course that an event and a memory of the event are not the same thing. Uh, and that uh, more than that, even memory cannot be used really in the singular, but that I was facing layers of memory, and I was engaged in a kind of excavation project. And so I would like to share at least uh, a number of the different kinds of memories, uh, both uh, accurate and, and mistaken, and those that are simply inaccessible, uh, that I think have to be distinguished. Now the first and the one that is the least accessible is what I would call repressed memories. And these are of course uh, experiences that even those who were there and experienced them uh, do not now remember. That as a defense mechanism to cope, they have had to repress and unless one is dealing with uh, recalled memories, recovered memories in rare cases, uh, the uh, survivors in fact will, will never recover these. Now I've became aware of this not so much through actually reading survivor testimonies, because of course they cannot testify to that which they cannot remember. Uh, but another case uh, was that an experience of my uncle during World War II. Uh, he was a missionary in Singapore uh, when the Japanese uh, conquered the island in February of 1942. Uh, he managed to have sent his wife and young child across the Indian Ocean on one of the last ships out of Singapore but chose to stay because he felt as a missionary he could not leave his flock and come back to them after the war uh, and that it was his duty to be there. Well, of course, his flock uh, basically were simply treated as locals, but he was immediately interned as an enemy alien, spent three and a half years in Changhe prison, uh, emerged half his body weight and barely alive. He also emerged from that experience with absolutely no memory that he had had a choice and he had chosen to stay. He could not have survived three and a half years if he had been beating himself up every day over having made a naive and uh, basically uh, unwise decision uh, that had uh, cost him three and a half years uh, of freedom and nearly his life. It was only when he went back to his garden and dug up his diary and read his diary that he could recover and become conscious of the fact that he had deliberately stayed when he could have escaped. Uh, now, I'm certain that uh, there are similar such traumatic kinds of events and experiences uh, of Holocaust survivors uh, for which repression has been the necessary defense mechanism for them to survive and we simply have to deal with the fact that some of what they experience we will never know and they will never know and that is part of the imperfection of the sources that we work with. A second layer of memory I would call secret memories. Again, here, these are searing events uh, that for the survivor are uh, so uh, sensitive that they have never told anyone. Uh, things such as uh, what we do know from certain memoirs when, when uh, survivors get to a point and they make a kind of confession, this is the first time I have told anyone whatever, stealing bread from a bunkmate, deserting friends or family. Uh, but uh, in the trauma of the Holocaust, obviously faced with one of the many, uh, to use Lawrence Langer's phrase, choiceless choices, choices that survivors always had to deal with, uh, events that were so searing and so painful uh, that they have simply chosen not to talk to anyone else about them. Another layer, I would say, is communal memory. Uh, and these are events that people who were in the same ghetto or the same camp uh, know about and talk to one another about, uh, but because they happened in a context so different than uh, the world they live in now, 
uh, and uh, they sensed that uh, people uh, who uh, might learn of this would not understand the framework with which these events took place and would make unrealistic and unfair judgments that uh, as a matter of kind of protection of one another. Uh, they talked about these things among themselves, but they do not talk about these things in public. There's a kind of a tacit understanding uh, that some of these things are best not uh, aired in public uh, and are uh, kept uh, only uh, to those who truly can understand the circumstances in which these events took place. And then finally, there are public memories, uh, those memories indeed which people do talk about openly, uh, and they form, of course, the bulk of the uh, testimonies of, say, the uh, videotape testimonies of the Shoah Foundation, uh, the testimonies that survivors uh, gave to investigating German lawyers preparing uh, for trial. Uh, these are the testimonies, these are the, the stories of public record. Well, over time, uh, of course, uh, these lines are not fixed. Uh, and one thing that I found is that uh, items that were secret and communal testimonies in the 60s have, in some cases, opened on me. Uh, things that were communal or secret testimonies in, in the 60s have gradually uh, become public testimony in the 90s. Uh, that some things that people could not talk about to anybody else or talk about outside the community. Uh, they have gradually uh, felt they could talk about. And so contrary to one of the basic historian's rules about eyewitness testimony, namely the closer it is to the event, the more reliable we should take it, and the further from the event, uh, the more skeptical we must be about it, may hold for details. But in terms of survivors' willingness to deal with very sensitive topics, there are some topics that we will talk about in the 90s that they could not talk about earlier, and the later testimonies are in fact fuller and more important for learning about some events that until then had been secret and communal memory. Now in addition to those layers of memory, there are also uh, mistaken memories uh, that the historian has to watch out, pitfalls that the historian has to sort his way or her way through. Uh, one of these uh, are what I would call collective memory. Uh, we talk about collective memory as a kind of the, uh, the memory that, that is held in a, in a kind of a group way or sometimes in an official way in which certain aspects of what in the past have been filtered out and consigned to amnesia and others have been played up uh, because they reflect more or much more about the point at which they are being recounted than they tell us about events in the past. They are a reflection of how people at the time at which they are talked about want the past to be remembered uh, rather than uh, a, 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 a accurate reflection of what happened many years earlier. Uh, the most graphic example in my own study uh, is not related to the war years but to the pre-war years. If one looks at the testimonies of the North Amer survivors, who, survivors who settled in North America, uh, they uh, came from Vierbschnik, which was a very, by their, by their description, uh, a very traditional Orthodox uh, Jewish town. People spoke Yiddish. Most of them went to the uh, Yiddish-speaking religious instruction after uh, public school. Uh, that they uh, basically uh, were very conservative. They don't mention the Bund, which was the big German Jewish Socialist Union. They don't mention left-wing Zionist groups like Hashemir Hatzair that are almost all present in urban Warsaw memory memoirs, for instance. This was a real backwater, uh, almost a kind of somewhat bigger than a shtetl, but it, it's not Fiddler on the Roof, but it was pretty much getting there. If, on the other hand, you read the community book that was produced in Israel in the 1970s and their account of Vyabzhnek in the 1930s, uh, it is not a traditional old conservative Yiddish-speaking community. It's a hotbed of Zionism. Uh, they're all out there in youth groups discussing and debating and having soccer matches and it's just uh, an endless uh, frenetic Zionist hoopla. Uh, and so clearly they have very divided memories on this issue and it reflects in part those that were Zionists, more likely with Israel, those that weren't went to North America. But once there, 
for survivors uh, to recreate their Polish past as not weak, passive diaspora Jews held in contempt, but as proud, macho Zionists about to become uh, good, uh, hardy uh, Israeli uh, assertive citizens, uh, they had to, in a sense, uh, massage their past uh, in a way uh, that uh, made them feel good about themselves and presented themselves to the wider Israeli public in a way compatible with uh, Israeli uh, standards. And so uh, there was a case where the collective memories in North America and, uh, and, uh, and Israel were very different. And the historian has to be conscious of, of how those changes take place. Uh, another pitfall the historian faces are what I call incorporated memories. Because the Holocaust, of course, has become increasingly an event about which we are widely conscious, there have been many documentaries, there are major uh, uh, important novels like Elie Wiesel's Night and Primo Levi, uh, that uh, you know, there are iconic photographs, uh, and uh, that many survivors see these, uh, and there's a point at which they begin to incorporate post-war knowledge uh, into their own memory and no longer able to separate out uh, what they actually experienced and uh, what certain iconic uh, tropes, uh, certain standard images and events of the Holocaust that they add to their story uh, because they have become so central to what it means to be a survivor. Now, in my own account, the most classic case of incorporated memory came when uh, the factory slave labor campus, Drakovica, is evacuated in the summer of 1944 uh, to Birkenau as the Red Army is approaching. Now, of course, uh, we know what the standard entry into Birkenau is, uh, that the train pulls up to the ramp, you get out, you form into lines of men and women, and then you march by a SS doctor, who in almost all accounts is Dr. Mengele, even though he couldn't have been there all the time, and with his baton, it's right, left, right, left. Uh, and this is certainly what happened to most transports that entered Beer Canal. It is not what happened to the transport from Strakovica. The transport from Strakovica was treated as an internal labor transfer, and they went into Beer Canal without a selection. And I am convinced that's the case because the majority of survivors tell us that they had this utterly atypical entry. They could not have made this up in unison. And the children who are survivors say, the miracle of my survival among the many miracles is that when we came to Beer Canal, there was no selection. I would not be alive today if there had been a selection. And yet there is a significant minority of the survivors whose testimonies I have that will give the standard, typical entry into Beer Canal. They got off the train, they formed into lines, there was Mengele and he was pointing left, right, left, right. And they believe it. Uh, and uh, they believe it because they have incorporated these key uh, post-war uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically uh, story of, of how one gets into Beer Canal into their own memory and they cannot distinguish between uh, their own unique experience and the, what is widely accepted as uh, the archetypal way uh, in which uh, one enters, uh, way, in way in which people uh, came uh, to that camp. Uh, so uh, with, with uh, collective memory, with uh, incorporated memory, the historian has to, again, be very, very careful. Now, all of this is to say the survivor testimony most certainly is an imperfect source, and, and we have to use it carefully. But having said that, I would also say all historical evidence is imperfect. The issue is not to use it or not to use it. If we waited to use only perfect evidence, we'd have very little history. What the historian has to do is be conscious of what are the imperfections, what are the problems with each of the kinds of evidence that is being used, uh, take that into the account, and do the best one can do under the circumstances. History is not a perfect science. We are trying to approach historical truth as close as we can, uh, but uh, we don't get there, uh, and we don't get there because we are both imperfect historians and we are working with imperfect evidence. Uh, but we still do the best we can. Well, having 
said that and, and, and given a bit about uh, the, the methodological side of things and the issue of sources, uh, what did I learn on the basis of my 292 witnesses? Uh, what can we say about the Strakovica camps? Well, I had two key things I wanted to look at. One was what do we learn about German policy and personnel through uh, the perspective and memory of the survivors? And what do we learn about the dynamics of the slave labor community and the strategies for survival uh, on the part of, uh, of the prisoner community? And let me go briefly about some of the conclusions uh, on each of those issues. Certainly for uh, the issue of the perpetrators and perpetrator policy. Uh, one issue that historians have debated about is the tension between uh, Nazi ideology and the primacy given to extermination on the one hand and the uh, necessities, uh, economic necessities that the war imposed upon uh, Germany on the other hand. Uh, that they had both an ideological goal of wiping out European Jewry and a uh, major necessity to try to win the war and at least to ward off defeat, which required having an effective wartime economy, which required having labor, uh, and of course uh, Jews were one of the sources of labor uh, that they had. And I wanted to find out how did this tension between the utilitarian demands of a wartime economy short of labor and an ideological imperative of extermination played out uh, in Strakowice. Uh, basically, uh, Himmler was clearly on the side of limiting the use of Jewish labor as much as he could. Uh, and uh, that uh, he set out three conditions for exempting some people uh, from being sent to the death camps as the ghettos were liquidated. Uh, the first of these conditions was that the work that Jewish labor was doing had to be directly involved in the war effort, not tangentially or peripherally. Uh, in the case of Strakowice, there was a blast furnace, a steel mill on the one hand, a munitions factory where they actually made shell casings and grenade casings, and then a lumber yard where they built the cases in which the stuff would be shipped. So there was no question that these three camps uh, and these three uh, industries were directly involved in the war effort. The second condition uh, was that the industrialists had to build the camps, guard the camps, uh, in order to make sure that these Jews were totally separated from the Polish population. And indeed, in Strakowice, the industrialists threw up uh, two of these camps very quickly, and the lumber yard itself uh, was transformed into uh, a place where um, sufficient prisoners could stay. Uh, so that they built three ad hoc camps in a matter of a few weeks uh, uh, as the date for uh, the liquidation of the ghetto approached. And finally, uh, the uh, factory owners had to, as I say, rent the slaves from the SS uh, and pay per head per day for each of these workers. And the result is, as I say, uh, in this case, uh, some 1,600 uh, Jews were left in Strakowice. Uh, a very high percentage in comparison to the surrounding towns uh, in this part of Poland, where normally about 5% of Jews were left for labor. Here we have nearly 30%, uh, so this was very key. Uh, once uh, these people went into the camps after the liquidation of the ghetto, because the camps had been built so quickly and because the industrialists had absolutely no experience in uh, building such camps, the sanitation and uh, health facilities in these camps were abysmal. And you crowd lots of people together into camps with no washing facilities, uh, and uh, you, what you produce is typhus, uh, and typhus epidemic swept these camps. Uh, they went in, the prisoners went into the camps at the end of October. Uh, by early December, typhus is breaking out, and a major typhus epidemic sweeps through the camps in December, January, February, March. Uh, of late 42, early 1943. Now, the reaction of the industrialists to this uh, was twofold. Their initial reaction was uh, that uh, typhus, uh, well, I should say, let me back up, typhus posed a real dilemma for them. For prisoners who got typhus, even if they survived, uh, they were going to be running a tremendously high fever, two or three weeks, fever normally in the 104, 105, 106, 
after which they would be totally debilitated for another three weeks. A prisoner who caught typhus was going to be out of commission, non-productive for at least six weeks, if he or she survived. Now, that meant for the industrialists that they were going to be paying the SS per head per day for workers who were not working for an extended period of time. Uh, and uh, the result, the, the conclusion that the industrialists drew from this was that this was an intolerable hemorrhage to their profits. Uh, and therefore, contrary to elsewhere, where sometimes the SS was called in periodically to carry out a selection of workers who could not work to take them away, to take them back, which meant to take them out to kill them, in Starakovica, the factory owners did the killing themselves. That the commandant, who was the head of the factory security, uh, basically descended on the camp every night and made prisoners go through exercises to see who was too weak to run or go up the steps or to walk a balance beam or other t uh, sadistic tests that uh, he devised. Uh, uh, and uh, on occasion would go into uh, the sick barrack and simply shoot everybody there. Uh, that by the end of, these, of this period, he clearly had single-handedly killed hundreds of people, uh, many of them in theatrically staged productions to which he invited his guests to come and amuse themselves uh, by witnessing. Uh, however, by March of 1943, uh, the ghettos in Poland had all been liquidated. The Jews that are still alive are either in hiding or have fled to the forest or under false identification. Uh, that uh, shortage of labor is significant and that there is no prospect that these camps are going to get any new reinforcements in sizable numbers. And the industrialists have a recalculation of their profit line. Dead workers cannot be brought back to life. Sick workers can be healed. Uh, and if you cannot replace workers that are dead, then it becomes uh, a long-term more profitable to not kill your sick workers any longer. And in this case, they send the killer commandant away. The new commandant comes into the camps and gives a speech. Obviously, the prisoners remember this speech, in which he says, we're not going to kill sick prisoners any longer. If you all work hard and loyally, you'll be allowed to live. Thereafter, living standards of the camps go up, improvements are made in sanitation, the death rates come way down and stabilize at a relatively low level thereafter, uh, so that uh, there are going to be a significant number of survivors from these camps. So that we can see in terms of this conflict between uh, ideological imperative for mass murder uh, and utilitarian imperative uh, to preserve scarce labor, uh, that the industrialists first had it one way, worked hand in hand with the SS, and then uh, at a parting of the ways took a different tact, and thereafter, in fact, worked uh, to preserve their uh, Jewish workers, uh, not uh, to exterminate them. Uh, and I think it's important to, to see this camp as a reflection of how, in fact, uh, there, the Nazi regime uh, was not monolithic. Uh, and indeed, uh, and particularly uh, in the later stages of the war, the industrialists could get away with this because the region of South Poland where these munitions were, there was a number of cities with munitions uh, uh, factories, the Radom district, uh, produced uh, by 1944 roughly 30 percent of the small arm ammunition of the German army. And even Himmler could not wipe out the labor producing uh, some 30 percent of the, of the munitions that were keeping the German army in the field. Well, let's move from the issue of policy to that of personnel. Uh, how did the prisoners remember the Germans? Well, they, of course, uh, I would say, for most of the, of the testimonies, when they're giving what I would call free-form testimony, simply telling their own story, such as they do uh, with the Fortunov archive or the Holocaust Museum tapes, or even in the Shoah Foundation tapes where there's an interventionist interviewer that uh, directs the, 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 the interview in some ways, they say very little about the Germans. These are mostly accounts of themselves and their families. But fortunately for me, I had 125 testimonies that derived from German judicial investigation, where by German law, the investigators needed to collect very specific information, not only about what Germans had done, but about the mindset with which they had done it. 
Had they killed out of a base motive, race hatred? Had they killed in a sadistic or duplicitous or, or um, malevolent manner? All of these required for a first degree murder conviction in Germany and any lesser charge had already passed the statute of limitations. And under careful questioning, targeted questioning, the survivors in fact could tell a great deal about the individual perpetrators. Uh, and thus I had a, an important body of testimony that would uh, help me uh, fill out that part of the story. And as I read these, it became increasingly clear uh, that certain terms, certain vocabulary uh, kept appearing that amounted to an unconscious form of classification. And that uh, for surviving, as a survival strategy, uh, the survivors had to know and make differences between Germans. One of the ways in which you survived was not mistaking one kind of German for another. And that uh, their rough categorization was as follows. One group of Germans was generally referred to as the dangerous Germans. These were the Germans when they came to camp would leave dead Jews behind them, that when they came you hid, you kept your distance, you stayed away. Uh, and uh, certainly the first killer commandant that I've already talked about was in the words of almost all the survivors the single worst German they had ever encountered in the entire war. If they ever put a name, that was the name that they came up with. Uh, but, and he was the archetype of the dangerous German. Uh, a second category was what they referred to as the decent Germans. These were Germans, often foremen in the factory, uh, with whom uh, Jews could work without being uh, subjected to rituals of humiliation and degradation, in which they would not be worked uh, in, uh, uh, in ways that were you know, designed to physically debilitate them. And indeed, if they, for instance, became hurt, uh, they would be allowed uh, to heal. Uh, that uh, you, Certain uh, of these foremen would people to which you would send elderly Jews, where they would be able to work at a pace that would allow them to survive. And it was very important to know who the decent Germans were because these were places of refuge when people were in real trouble uh, and needed to find uh, a work site uh, where uh, they would uh, be allowed in effect to recover uh, and uh, to uh, gain strength. So the decent Germans, small in number, uh, were very crucial and survivors wanted to make sure that these people were not, were not forgotten. Uh, that uh, once I began working in this and, and interviewing people, of course, word spread among the survivors. Uh, and I remember getting a phone call uh, from New York, a man talking in a very uh, deep uh, Polish-Jewish accent, said, I, I hear you're, you're writing a history of Strakowice. And I said, well, yes, I am. And you're taking interviews. I said, yes, I am. Said, well, you have to talk to me. And I said, I would love to. And I went up to New York. Uh, and interviewed him, and it was very clear from the beginning. The reason why he wanted to be interviewed was he wanted to make sure his decent German got into the story, because he was the key liaison between that German and the rest of the, uh, of the prisoner community. He was kind of the man's favorite, and thus had a leverage uh, and a way of, of negotiating that, that made both him and his role and his decent German increasingly important. Uh, and then finally, there was a third group referred to as the corruptible Germans. Uh, these were Germans with, uh, who basically could be bribed. Uh, now, certainly when one is reading German documentation, the whole picture of the Germans that one gets, of course, is uh, of people who present themselves as bringing law and order and civilization uh, to a barbaric, primitive East. Uh, they're the carriers of an advanced way of life. When one sees Germans through survivors, what one sees is people of utterly insatiable greed uh, for whom they can never fill their pockets deep enough. Uh, and that uh, the German occupation of Eastern Europe uh, is a, a basically a nonstop gold rush uh, in which they are trying uh, to uh, enrich themselves personally at no end, which gave survivors some form of leverage. The greed of the perpetrators was one of the few uh, chinks in the armor that gave otherwise defenseless, helpless people some kind of opening. Uh, and certainly in Strakowice, uh, finding out who the corruptible Germans were and cutting deals with them, virtually putting them on retainer 
uh, to provide certain mitigations and certain services was crucial. Uh, that uh, through bribery, for instance, it was decided that the Ukrainian guard would remain outside the fences and only internally it would be the camp council and the camp police that would run things. Uh, that medicines could be smuggled in from the outside, and above all, that they would be given warning when inspections were coming so that they could hide children. That this had become a de facto family camp as children were either smuggled in or uh, the privileged Jews in the camp, which we'll talk about in a bit, were allowed to bring in their children to begin with. Uh, and uh, clearly, uh, they, they, uh, the warning uh, that the SS inspectors were coming was very crucial. Uh, and they developed very elaborate hiding places to uh, preserve uh, the children in the camp. But it all required, as I say, advance warning for which they had to pay. Uh, so the corruptible Germans were a very essential and important part of the story. Well, let's turn then to the prisoner community itself. Uh, and here I would like uh, to, to, to note, uh, certainly, uh, that uh, the first thing is important to note is that the prisoner community itself is not monolithic, uh, that it has its layers. Uh, and indeed, in the, even in, in Wierpschnick, uh, you had people who came, and we can divide them by seniority. You had the first layer of people who were the pre-1939 inhabitants of the town. Uh, then you had people who were sent from Western Poland, who were ethnically cleansed from Western Poland in 1940-41. And then in 1942, as the ghetto liquidations begin, people from surrounding towns would flee to Wierpschnick's Drakowice uh, to get factory jobs because they felt that was their best chance of survival. And then once in the camps, uh, there were small numbers of people brought in from the outside that formed a kind of fourth layer. So you really had four layers of seniority in the camp in a kind of pecking order because uh, key positions in the camp among the privileged Jews uh, generally belonged to the old timers. And this, I think, was true of other camps as well. The old timers had the best positions. The newcomers were always at the greatest disadvantage. Uh, a, uh, and indeed, in, in, in the memories of the survivors, there are two things that stick out about the Strakowice camps. And they, of course, go through many camps during the war. The first is that these were the dirtiest camps they'd ever encountered. And the second was it was the most inegalitarian camp culture uh, of any group of camps they had been in. Part of it was because of the seniority that I've just mentioned. But two other factors were key for the inequality of the prisoner community as well. One was uh, uh, an issue uh, of German manipulation. From the very beginning of the camps, long before there are any Jewish prisoners, uh, at Dachau in 1933, uh, the SS discovers uh, the benefits of the so-called Kapo system. And that is using some prisoners to control other prisoners. Initially, this meant bringing in hardened criminals from the German prisons, murderers and rapists and whatever, and putting them in control of the political prisoners, the communists and socialists and labor union leaders, and the privileged prisoners keep their privileges as long as they brutalize and totally dominate uh, the non-privileged prisoners. That principle then becomes writ large throughout the German camp system. We, of course, see it in the, in the, in the Jewish councils and the ghettos. And even in the factory slave labor camps, it is replicated. There is a camp council, a camp police. They control the camp kitchen. They control who is in charge of the, the, the barracks elders. And above all, they in, are in charge of who gets assigned what jobs so that uh, the privileged Jews uh, have a, a dominant position. They live better, they dress better, they eat better. Uh, those that were working with the Germans from the beginning were allowed to bring their families in. Uh, and uh, thus you have a big political inequality between privileged and non-privileged prisoners. In the case of Vierbschnick Strakowice, that is intensified by an economic inequality. Most of the German camps, people came in from everywhere, and they came in uh, basically with nothing uh, uh, but what the clothes they were wearing. Uh, and often, in that case, they're stripped of that almost immediately. What made Vierbschnick Strakowice different was that the major portion of the prisoners in those camps were in their hometown. That meant that before the liquidation of the ghetto, many of them were able to leave property with Polish friends, Polish business associates, Polish acquaintances. 
because the Jews would come to the factory and work side by side with Polish workers, a black market exchange could take place and people could access their property. And that therefore the local Jews had an immense economic advantage over Jews brought in from the outside because they could access their property and that was crucial of course, one for paying bribes and secondly for paying for extra food and rations and to eat and live better. So there was an economic inequality uh, in the camp, a political inequality, a, uh, a, a seniority inequality, and all of these then together created, as I say, one of the most inegalitarian camp cultures that the prisoners encountered as they toured the Nazi camp system. What mitigated or balanced that inequality was the fact that these factory slave labor camps were de facto family camps and that the family as a nucleus of support remained intact. How did this happen? Well, first of all, uh, people bought their work permits to be chosen as workers to be in the camps. Basically, this was a case where slaves bought their slavery. And the alternative was to go to Treblinka and be murdered. Uh, so that uh, many of the families, and this of course favored better off families as opposed to uh, less property families, uh, would buy work permits for the father, the mother, and the teenage children. And if they had younger children, they would place them, hide them with poles, uh, and that they would go into the camp uh, as, uh, as a family nucleus. Once the death rates dropped way down in the camp, it was safer to bring young kids into the camp than to leave them in hiding uh, outside because that was always subject to informers and denunciation. And so children would be smuggled into the camp after the spring of 1943. And the result is that uh, most of the prisoners in the camp had some kinds of family ties. They were not there as atomized, isolated individuals. Uh, and uh, with family ties and neighborhood ties, uh, that there were networks, there were people one could rely upon, uh, there was a support system that balanced, in a sense, the highly inegalitarian structure of the camp uh, and was crucial for prisoners' survival and how they coped uh, with the situation they were in. So that, in a sense, the camps were both unusual in the degree to which they were family camps on the one hand, and unusual in the degree that they were in egalitarian on the other, but the two kind of balanced out and, the, and the, the, the perseverance of family ties, the ability of the family nucleus to withstand all of the pressures of that situation provided a crucial support uh, for survival uh, in the case, uh, in, in, in very many cases. Well, uh, in, in all of this, then, uh, I think we can see this. Uh, there, basically, what I found out was that there was a kind of a texture and a, and a, a variety or a particular stamp on these, this community uh, of prisoners that was somewhat different than uh, that which one gets in the uh, often told stories of, say, Auschwitz, where almost everybody is strangers coming in from outside. If they make ties, it's because they're all communists or they're Hungarians will group with the Hungarians against the Poles or whatever else but nothing like the intimacy uh, of the small-scale camp uh, that we see in Starakovica. Uh, it did, on one hand, as I say, provide support, but that also provided for some very significant tensions. Uh, and perhaps the greatest example of tensions in the prisoner community that ultimately exploded into a violence that remained communal memory, not public memory, until the 1990s, uh, was a case uh, that led to revenge killing of prisoners against other prisoners. Uh, in the case of Strakovitsa, the last group of people who come in from the outside were hardened survivors from the neighboring district of Poland to the east, Lublin district. These are people that had survived one wave of massacre after another. They were the, basically the remnant of a remnant of a remnant of a remnant uh, that are moved uh, out of Majdanek to Strakowice in the spring of 1944. And when they come in, they challenge the privileged prisoners uh, for control in the camp, but uh, the privileged group pay their protectors more and preserve their position. 
uh, and these hardened veterans of the camps to the east find themselves at the bottom of the hierarchy in terms of who gets the worst jobs and whatever else, uh, and they were very embittered about this. Uh, when uh, the camp is evacuated, and the privileged prisoners are put into the first railway car of the train going to Birkenau. A number of the Lublin prisoners slip into that front car, and on the night uh, after they leave uh, Starakovica, uh, a fight breaks out between them and the uh, head of the uh, lager of the camp council, uh, and the head of the kitchen, and some of the most privileged of the privileged prisoners who are either strangled or stamped to death. And when the car arrives in Birkenau, uh, some close to 20 uh, Jews have been killed by fellow Jewish prisoners. Uh, this was not a story anybody wanted to talk about after World War II. Uh, it is not a story they wanted to talk to German investigators about in the 1960s for fairly obvious reasons. It is only in 1989-1990 uh, that the dam finally broke and what had been a communal memory uh, began to become a public memory uh, as uh, people at that distance began to talk about it more openly. Uh, even then, uh, there is some reticence to talk about it, say, on the taped, uh, on the taped testimonies of the Shoah Foundation, uh, where you're going to end up surrounded by your grandkids and, and your family. Uh, but uh, certainly even those who just hinted at it there, in all of the interviews I had, no one uh, attempted in any way to uh, fudge over this uh, on a personal basis uh, when a, in a situation where they were not being visually recorded. Uh, they were quite willing by then to talk about it very, very frankly. And that, I think, clearly was a case of where uh, something went from a communal memory to a public memory over a long period of time. Uh, certainly events like that, as well, of course, the, the, the other kinds of difficulties of survival and the strains and stresses of the inegalitarian camp culture uh, are all difficult to study and, and difficult to read. Uh, but I do think it's important uh, when we do study this topic that uh, we don't take survivor testimonies and try to sanitize them or try to cast them in a false heroic mode. Uh, certainly the survivors themselves don't. The survivors themselves are under no illusion, one, about their own faulty memories. Uh, they are much more willing to concede and, and speak openly about the difficulties of what they can remember and they cannot. And uh, now increasingly, uh, certainly uh, by the 90s, they are willing to talk about even the most uh, difficult and sensitive topics, including that of revenge killings in the camp. And so I think it's important that we do, when we, when we think about these topics, uh, that uh, I mean, it seems fairly obvious we say that the Holocaust is not a feel-good story. Uh, we don't read this because we want a happy ending. Uh, and we can't expect and we should not expect from survivor testimonies that they are going to give us stories uh, of edification uh, with feel-good endings, uh, that that is not what we should expect from them. Uh, that uh, what we find that is if you take people and you subject them uh, to starvation, to humiliation, and you take members of their families and kill them, you subject them to exhausting work, you are not going to turn ordinary people into saints. You're going to take, turn people into people trying to survive, and survival is not often a pretty story. Uh, so that when we do look at these survivor testimonies, when we do study this topic, I think it's very important uh, that we do not uh, expect, as I say, stories of redemption and edification. Uh, what we do get is stories of survival, and for that we should be very grateful. Thank you very much.